Hello mm. and welcome along to this fourth edition of the Tony Stone's Chat Room podcast with, yes, yours truly, Tony Stone. And joining me in the chat room this particular edition of the podcast, I'm really delighted to welcome none other than, well, I think we will do beauty before age, and we'll start with the one and only Mr. Earl Oakin. Oh my God! I can't deny it. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> and also joined by the, the love, equally lovely, really wonderful Miss Fiona Ross. Well, I feel I should say thank you, but after that intro, I'm not actually so sure. No, now. quite so. Kind of rude. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but ser- seriously, Earl, the reason why I sort of mention that is because you are actually, if you can just pop your guitar down on the side for a moment because we'll come to that in a second or two but you're not just an amazing guitarist true but you're also a wonderful singer songwriter and comedian yeah i'm not actually actually a guitarist at all but never mind how do you describe what you do actually rather than me trying to explain it how do you well my main talents are singing and writing songs and i play piano and guitar in that order uh, to accompany myself, I, I could never work as a pianist or a guitarist because, frankly, I'm not good enough. I love it when you have your um, own trio and you say at the beginning that you yes. need them because they make you look good. No, no, what I say is I have to be the leader of this trio because I'm not good enough to be in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Because, <laughs> I mean, a real pianist can play in any key, can sight read or at least read the chords. I can't do any of those. Um, I can when I play within what I can do. People think I can play better than I really can, because I make certain that I play things that I can play and don't try things that I can't. As long as you do that, that that's all you need to do, really. Now, Fiona, we'll bring you in here. <laughs> we should just keep talking to her. Well, we to should, be should we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, hello, hello. Thank, thank you. I didn't mean that uh, introduction. That was that was a, a joke. But um, the, the lovely Fiona Ross. How do you sum up what you do in your entertainment career? How do I sum it up? Mm. Um, Okay, well, I'm a vocalist, I'm a pianist, I'm a composer, I'm a producer, and I'm a journalist. I'm a journalist. That's, we'll come, that's my titles. We'll, we'll, we'll come back. <laughs> and an educator. Actually. An educator, yes. Yes. So and in fact, we'll come probably, back to the education. Or crazy woman. Or crazy woman. I quite like crazy woman. That's more realistic. Yeah. The others just sound a bit fancy. I, I stopped being an educator <laughs> some 30 years ago. Well, I was deputy head of a primary school. Oh, were you? <laughs> yeah, I couldn't do primary school. I can't. I mean, I love... I was going to say I love children. I, I had a girl in I my couldn't. class who had a voice like Louis Armstrong. Oh, really? He was most... <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I showed them a film of Louis Armstrong once when he was young, and the whole class just pointed at her. And she's going, <laughs> really? she's going, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Sorry. Now, um, oh, you've been in show business a bit longer than the oh, owner yes. has been in show business, which is not meaning in any bad way, but you have over fifty years. Yeah, you've oh, been well, in I'm sh- not that old. No, exactly. I did my first. <laughs> I did my first telly in 1959. Wow. What was that experience like going... What was the show that you actually were on? It was called, uh, all, it's called All Your Own. It was nothing about teeth. It was um, <laughs> a sort of very BBC sort of talent show, but not just talent, because it also had kids on it who had interesting hobbies. So on the, uh, in the sort of episode that I was in, there were some children who were making toy soldiers out of lead, which wouldn't be allowed now. Oh. Um, then there were others who made corn dollies, but there was also a young ballet dancer and me. So it was a mixture of sort of Blue Peter with a sort of talent show, but without the competition element. So it was more like a sort of Radio 3 version of a children's talent show. You know, it was very BBC. And and that was your... And who can you remember who the host was? And- yes, I can, because it should have been Hugh Weldon, and because I was looking forward to him. I used to like watching him and he wasn't there that week but I didn't realise at the time but I was being interviewed by another legend called Brian Johnson. Oh well the cricket commentator of yes. course. 
Of course, because that's another one of your passions. And that's actually what I want this podcast to be about. It's about your lives and your careers and your experiences so that anybody that's viewing the show out there will come away knowing a bit more about Earl and a bit more about Viona than they did at the beginning and will hopefully want to go and check you out and see you live maybe and stuff like that. So let's go back a little bit to the beginning Fiona, perhaps you can come in on this one first. Your earliest inspirations and recollections of um, music and your favourites from Music Biz, where did you get them from? Oh, uh, well, um, I have uh, one of those crazy stage mums. So I've been performing. I think my first professional job was when I was like two. So I was kind of thrown into this crazy performing arts world literally as soon as I could walk. So I've not known anything other than that. My uh, dad was a, a huge kind of old school jazz fan. So he loved kind of Louis Armstrong, Bing, uh, Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, all, all that all that kind of uh, the old school uh, jazz. Oh, it's got a story about Bing which we'll bring in a bit later. Oh, oh honestly, I, know, I'm kind of, I just want to talk to Earl, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, so I was brought up very much, but my mum was kind of classical, so she was very much uh, kind of like opera. But I kind of went to a, a crazy stage school and, and did the whole uh, uh, kind of um, stage school performing arts training. So I've had literally kind of influences all over the place. I mean, my brother, he's 10 years older than me. He was always into rock. So I remember his bedroom was kind of this really cool place where he used to listen to Blondie and kind of uh, <laughs> the Eagles and all this kind of stuff. Um, so honestly, I have literally, music has been around me in many different ways, literally since I was kind of born. Okay. Can you remember what your first ever <laughs> album was that you bought? I can. Well, I did, my brother bought me my first ever record. Which was? Um, it was Greatest Hits of 10cc. <gasps> wow. Interesting. That was my first ever. He bought it for me for my birthday. Brian, I can't remember how old I was. That to Brian be Johnson bought me a drink once at the 606. Oh. There we go. <laughs> anyway. That was my first ever. And what was the first one that you bought? I don't know. You can't remember? I really can't. Oh, can you remember what your first album was? And no, because you... I bought 78. 78, <laughs> which is even older than the album. Yeah, I'm, I can was... you explain to any viewers that perhaps are watching who might not know what 78s are? Yes, and that's why they're called albums in America. They've taken it over to mean LPs because 78s used to be in albums. And you've got album sets of 78s. You open them like a Book. photograph al- album. Um, but uh, like you got a complete opera, you, you needed 12 78s in an album. That's how that name came to be. Uh-huh. Uh, I was, uh, let me see, something like two years old, and the Pakistani students staying with us had a wind-up gramophone. And just as Nelson Dorma suddenly became an operatic hit in recent times, the one for 1949-50 was Jane, Joan Hammond, singing Oh My Beloved Father, also Puccini. And he wound, the, he had the, everybody had this record and he wound it up and played it to me and I was transfixed by this melody and I couldn't get it out of, out of my, and quite right, because it's wonderful. And I've been a Puccini freak ever since, although at the time I didn't know what it was. And my father saw that I was interested in music. I was, I remember my first professional gig, you could say, was an accident. <clears throat> I was there was a record out by somebody who later became known as a disc jockey called Jimmy Young. And he had a hit record in 1950, 1950 probably, called um, Too Young. They try to tell us we're too young. That's the song. And I knew this immediately. And we, are, it, we were at Brixton Market. And I started singing along with it in my piercing soprano and earned one and threepence. <laughs> and my mum made me give it back. And we got home and the neighbour said, fool, take him back again next week. <laughs> so that's, that was my first professional. What was, your, what was your first professional booking? Can you... Oh, I say it was when I was two. I was doing modelling and all sorts of things. So mm. from a very young age. And but I, singing, I was, singing wise? Uh, yeah, I did kind of radio stuff when I was about, I think, five. I, had my, I, was, um, I was on the West End when I was um, six. Uh. So I had my first lead role in the West End when I was six. Oh, wow. So Wh- which, which role was it? Guess. Annie, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Annie, you were an Annie. I, yeah, I was Annie when I was so. I yeah, so honestly, I literally have been doing this. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Yeah. I once met Charles Strauss. 
Oh, really? Yes, at the Pheasantry, <laughs> funnily enough. Ah, OK. Which is a, a wonderful venue here in London. I'm old enough to have met jo- Johann Strauss. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, have you really met Johann Strauss? No, the 19th century. <laughs> well, I... I that anyway. was pretty... Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, doing quick calculation. No, that won't work. Now, obviously, the, the two of you kind of do have this sort of connection that we call jazz. So, hey, baby, yeah. 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 So, so tell us, you were just talking about your home and everything and stuff and the, the, your jazz roots and stuff. With Oh, with you, where did your love of jazz well, come from? Well, I didn't realise at first, but the first record that my father bought me when I was three... Because he realised I liked jazz, and there was a wind up. People were getting rid of their wind up gramophones because electric gramophones were coming in, and uh, so he bought me a wind up gramophone in Tooting Market for half a crown, <laughs> which is twelve and a half pence in modern money, <laughs> and then for threepence each, which is just over a penny. There were six seventy eights, one of which was Ruth Etting, uh, who I assume must be long gone dead. In fact, she didn't die for another fifteen twenty years after that. <clears throat> and singing in the late 20s, her big hit, Love Me or Leave Me. And I used to listen to her accompanist, uh, accompanists as well, not realising that I was actually listening to Eddie Lang and Joe Venuti. But I always used to like that without really knowing what it was. But uh, my real love was grand opera. Uh-huh. And um, I used to go to the opera. Uh, the only f- non-opera singer that I was potty about, which was actually the first Live concert I ever went to was in 1956 when we all went to see somebody just been given his passport back and was hated in his own country and adored and loved here. And his name was Paul Robeson. <laughs> so that's what I first saw. Then I went to see the great, last of the great tenors, Jussi Björling, and I saw this great guitarist, Segovia. This is all in the 50s. And then I started going to the opera and seeing Tito Gobi and Boris Christoph. So it was only in the 60s when I really got into jazz. And what was happening was, while the Beatles and all that stuff was going on, I thought, well, I can do that, you know, because it's not that complicated, pop music. But they started bringing out on a cheap label LPs called the Ace of Hearts and the Ace of Clubs. All these reissued 78s, but on LPs. Um, Cab Calloway, Duke Ellington, Red Nichols... All that stuff, and I was, and they because they were cheap labels. It was only a pound for for, a, so I was listening to this all the time. And of course, that's when I heard Art Wetzel, his first Duke's first trumpet player, and I used to sit at the age of fourteen in front of the speaker and try and join in. And I go. That's how that started. Ah. Um, And uh, so that's how jazz. And, of course, then I fell in love with the singing of a certain Peggy Lee. Mm. Uh, Who who doesn't? Well, there you go. Um, I actually, I know this is not allowed, but I actually prefer her singing even to Ella Fitzgerald. (gasps) Oh, okay. (laughs) Uh, Mainly because she's more versatile. Oh, hang on a minute. I'll I'll chuck in Ella's (laughs) Beatles album. Mm? Ella did a whole album of, of Beatles music. Yeah, but not. It didn't work. It never. It didn't sound right. It sounded like a jazz singer trying to do pop music. When when Peggy Lee did something in a different genre, she made it somehow work for her. Mm-hmm. Doing it and doing it well aren't always the same thing. I mean, the, Ella's songbooks are just pieces of. They're like Encyclopedia Britannica. You mm. have to have them. I mm. mean, it's, it defines what you do. But when she's working outside her genre, she, I mean, her bossa nova wasn't very good. And uh, I, d- I don't like her doing pop, so it just doesn't work. Fiona, you're, you're giving a bit of facial things there. No, I just don't think I've ever been in a situation when someone has openly... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> criticised. <laughs> Criticised Ella Fitzgerald. I'm quite taken back. But no, look, we all have our different opinions and different lights. I'm similar. No, I mean, Actually, she's, Sarah she's, Vaughan, who again is phenomenal, she did some albums similar to that with some pop and some other things and I'm not a fan of no. those at all. I'm not Ooh. really a Sarah so, Vaughan fan, to no, be honest. No, but she that did a Vibrato's similar thing and I was like, oh, you know, um, yeah. I, I don't think I've really listened to a lot of Ella's stuff of, of yeah. what you were talking about. I mean, so no, I mean, I'm not dis- Agree. No, no. I mean, just just, I mean, Ella, don't <laughs> get me wrong. Ella, Ella, I mean, oh you can't, God. you can't get better than Ella Fitzgerald. Yeah. You really can't. When she's on her own ground, yeah. 
when she's singing jazz, the American Songbook. Yeah. I mean, that, of course, the one she did with Duke Ellington is um, stunning because mm. you've got a genius with a genius. Mm-hmm. I actually saw her, I saw her as an opening act, as a support act once at what's now called the Apollo Hammersmith. Mm-hmm. It was then called uh, the Odeon Hammersmith. Yeah, about 1968, and uh, uh, Ella was the opening act with Tommy Flanagan Tree, and I got to know Tommy later on, but that's another story. Um, but uh, she was the opening act. That's she was, a, she was a support act. Oh my god! And of course, I, I've actually yeah, met. Yeah, but the main act was Duke Ellington Orchestra. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> and okay. I don't care who you are. <laughs> Still, yeah. I don't care who you are. You open for the Duke Ellington yeah. Orchestra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless you, but when she sang, I also saw her with Count Basie, and he did it differently. He had her come on in the middle of the show as a special guest. Okay. Which I think Duke did sometimes with her as well. But it's that particular tour she was doing her own set at the beginning. I actually once met Ella twice. um, (gasps) You told me about one time, I think. With Tommy Cooper died. Yes, that's it, yeah. uh, That's an incredible story. story, You should be here. I know, I should be here. You should be here telling... Do you know what? You don't leave me. You guys should just sit here and uh, and tell these wonderful stories. I don't have wonderful stories. Wonderful meeting. Have you... I mean, she was one of my heroes. Mm. Have you... I know you've met one of your heroes, but have you ever met one of your heroes in any sphere? Oh, that sounds quite depressing now. I think, well, actually, Michelle Camilo, um, who, because uh, obviously I'm a pianist as well, uh, and I have two kind of huge, uh, that are alive, uh, piano heroes. One is Hiromi and one is Michelle Camilo. I've never heard of either of those. Have you not? Well, oh, Hiromi, I mean, if I know oh, her. Oh, I can't, yeah, don't get me started. But yes, as a pianist, they're phenomenal. Mm. Um, but I interviewed Camilo. And it was one of those things, I, you know, with the journalist work uh, I do, I basically just email loads of people that I'd like to talk to. <laughs> I started off with kind of a list of, oh, wouldn't it be great? Uh, and, uh, and yes, um, they emailed back and I, I got to interview Camilo. So that for me was, was significant. What does she do? He's a pianist. He? Yes. Okay. Uh, Latin, Latin, kind oh, okay. of, yeah, am- oh, amazing. And he he very much kind of turned me on to that style of jazz and going beyond the kind of jazz standards. So what so. is it about him that you are attracted to in oh, his playing? Just, well, um, the energy, and in fact, Hiromi and Camino in two different ways that they smile continuously when they're playing. And why that's relevant to me is that they feel it. Every single note they play, it's like it belongs to them. There's no falseness. There's no kind of I'm, I'm working. This is it, it belongs to them. And that, for me, is genuine. Mm. The smiles, the energy, the emotion. And obviously, they're both incredibly technically superior. I mean, crazy playing. Um, but yeah, it's the it's the it's just the the genuine emotion of their playing. Right. I think the energy. Right. One question that I always like to ask our guests of the week when I can, and I'm going to chuck this open to you too as well. If there's anybody watching that perhaps thinks, "Oh, I like to give this showbiz lark a bit of a go," <laughs> I'm music. I'm quite musically okay. I think I could have a go in this. Is there any advice? that you would give to aspiring musicians that might be watching the podcast? <laughs> I'm oh? going to let you answer that one first. Do you mean from musical point of view or business point of view? Both. From the business point of view, the most important thing, if you can, is A, get going while you're young because there's an incredible amount of ageism in the business. If you get over 25, it already doubles your difficulty. Um, and secondly, while you're young, get hold of a really good manager. A manager has to do two things. One, they have to sell you, so they've got to really, A, be able to have the contacts, and B, they've got to really believe in you, they've got to really think that you can really make it. If you can get that combination, then you're liable to get someone. That you think of Brian Epstein. That's the sort of thing he did. I mean, he didn't have the contacts, but somehow he got them because he seriously believed in the Beatles. It's very difficult for us to think of, say, the Beatles now as an unknown group. But in 1961, nobody had heard of them at all. That's, that's yeah? true. When I, you know, I knew Dick, Dick James, who became their publisher, and he told me that when he came in, Brian Epstein said, look, They've got this record deal and they've got this single out, which was P.S. I Love You and uh, what was the other side? Um, 
can't remember for the minute, but you know, they're, they're first, and it's on a red label, part of her, and the only one that was red label. And on it, you'll say Ardmore and Beechwood, which is the EMI publishing company. But they weren't doing anything to push it. And he said, if you can get them on TV, I'll give you their publishing. And Dick told me at the time, he said, you know, he liked them, you know, it was a nice young group, and that was it. But he never, ever dreamed what was going to happen. But he got them, he rang up Pete Murray, who's about the only DJ of that time who is not in jail now. Um, <laughs> and he said, you know, and he said, uh, well, Dick, if you think they're good enough, they're, we've still got the open spot, they're on next Thursday. So he put the phone down, um, said they're on TV next Thursday. Brian Epstein said, you've got their publishing. And Dick told me, he said, you know, he thought he make, might make a few hundred quid out of it and thought nothing more of it. <laughs> but within a year, he was a millionaire. Yeah. And that was back then when a million pounds oh, yeah. was a million pounds, of, of course. So, Fiona, after hearing yeah. that, what sort of advice have, would you give to anybody uh, well, watching? I think for me, it, firstly, I think it chooses you rather than you choosing it. I think that's key. And I, I know, and, and as an educator in the past, I know I was the same. You, know, you have a lot of people who want to be famous or they want to do this, that and the other. And you, you can't get into the industry if that's your aim, to be famous. You know, if you've got any chance, it has to be because the music is part of you. You have to be incredibly disciplined. You have to be incredibly driven and passionate. And it's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard. Um, but you need to be the best you can possibly be and know the business. And I think that's different. So when I was initially training, the business part of it, that was not part of my training. That wasn't anything I was ever taught. You know, that is recently in my kind of career as a, a, an artist in my own right, right in the past kind of year or so. I've had to learn actually a significant amount about the industry, do you, do you think, which I that was not part of my initial and do you, training. Do you think it is that important now that people need to know the business element of show yeah, business? Yeah, but I mean, for, to be honest, in any craft, you should, for me, I was like, don't you should know everything you can possibly know about whatever your craft is. You know, whether that's the technicality of it, the business side of it. I mean, every part of it to be to be the best you can be in that area and to stand a chance in an insanely competitive world, yeah, you've got to know everything about it. I mean, I made this huge mistake when I was 20 years old. Ah, I've, we've, we've spoken about this before because yeah. I know what you're going to say. Yeah. So let me just quickly move on to the next question okay. and you can answer this. Okay. Um, regrets. Yes. Do you have any... I've re had a few. Yeah. Regrets. <laughs> we burst into song. <laughs> yes. Have, uh, oh, let, let, we'll come to you because you told us this. Didn't well, I, as I told you, I, I was taken to Dick James, who we really got off on a really, we like one another. Uh, I happened to be Jewish, so was he. I mean, it, it, it was a sort of, not because we're Jewish, but there's a certain way, a certain sort of, it's very difficult to put into words, but there's a certain culture which we had in common without even mentioning it. It was just something about the way we spoke. Um, there's a word we use in Yiddish called chayn, and he had it, and I suppose he thought I had it, and we just got on from the word go. And I'd written this song called I Can't Face the Animals, which I th was playing around with a string quartet, and I wrote this song, and he, he looked at me and as if he'd seen a ghost. He said, I want you to hear the Beatles' next single, which hadn't been put out yet, and it was called Eleanor Rigby, mm -hmm. and it had exactly the same concept, different tune, but zoom, 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 oh, yeah. zoom, the string quartet. So that's how I joined him. He, you know, he wanted to work with me, got me some covers with sort of black and people but he then wanted to start his own record label about a year later I stupidly wanted to finish my degree now you can do a degree any time in your life sure. doesn't matter what you can't do only is become famous as a pop singer any time and I made the huge mistake of saying I want to finish my degree first wow so I was going to be away for the next 18 months and he wasn't going to wait for that. So he had another singer on his books <laughs> with whom he did not get on at all. First of all, he was from the generation that was uncomfortable with gay people, but it wasn't just that. He just didn't get on. But he'd promised him that he would work on his career, so he did. And he put out an LP of this chap and it didn't do too well. He said, no, let's have another go. And the second one caught on. And this chap was called Reg Dwight. <laughs> and they decided that wasn't a very good name. So they changed it to Elton John. So Elton basically had your career? Basically. What a thief. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and I'm and it's, I'm not saying this because I'm bitter, but <laughs> uh, but God, I write better songs than he's ever done. What than Ooh. Elton John? Yeah. <gasps> Ooh. Anytime. Ooh, Elton, if you're watching, <laughs> I love Elton John. <laughs> he's written about four or five songs. The rest of them, I can't tell one from the other. <gasps> yeah. No, I mean the Beatles, ABBA, Stevie Wonder. Stevie those Wa- those are great songwriters. Elton John. Huh. Really, you don't consider it. You don't consider him one of the great songwriters? Definitely not. Not even in the top league. Right. Uh, Cow King, yes. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Now, we've been having a, a kind of hint of an instrument down there on the floor. That could sound so very wrong. It's not a euphemism. <laughs> it is an actual... There's a hint of an instrument, instrument down yeah, there. Yeah, an actual guitar, <laughs> which I can see lurking around <clears throat> the stage. I think maybe if the two of you are up... <coughs> For this, perhaps we could do a, a first here and have a live little number <laughs> from my guests, which would be rather, rather lovely. And we were kind of trying to work out, or you two were working out on the way into the studio, exactly what you would perhaps do. Well, I thought we'd do the slow movement of Marla's Fifth. Yes. Oh, OK. Well, well, mm. ready? Do you want me to conduct? <laughs> do you want me to conduct? But we're not going to do that. We're going to put that maybe for we, the next we're not time. Actually do no, that. maybe for the next time. <laughs> I know I know we said we blag it that we're not actually no. going to. For the next time, but I, I know actually what you are going to do. <laughs> You're going to do a very one of my actual favorite jazz standards is it really? of all. Yes. Is it? It is. Oh no, that's pressure now. You should have mm. said that when we were like just before we uh, came in, we were what should we sing? We're, we're, we're going to we're gonna do it in 5/4, aren't we? Oh, lovely. I, I love it. <laughs> and and do you know what, what what key you're going to do it in? We're doing it in the amazing key of G. Oh. Oh my gosh. And what is it that you're going to be doing for our viewers to know? Uh, all of me. <gasps> she says, looking at me. Like, all of me, right? Take it away. All of me. Why not take all of me? Can't you see? I'm no good. You take my arms I'll never use them Take my lips I'll never use them Your goodbyes And we're with eyes that cry Ba ba go on, dear, without you. Ba You took the part that once was my heart. So why not take all of me? <laughs> Why not take all of me? 
Sung together, I just like to say. Fantastic. <laughs> well, both. I'd like to do that more. Not yeah, now. yes. We'll have to <laughs> put you together in a show or something. <laughs> That'd be cool. Now, actually, talking about shows, I can't believe, but we've actually almost run out of time. There's so much more that I want to talk hey. to you both about. We've only just literally scraped the surface with the two of you. So you're going to have to come back, both of you, at some point in the future and, and do it all again. But in the meantime, Fiona, yes. where can our viewers go and find out all about you, check you out, maybe even see you live, what have you got coming up, all that kind of stuff? Uh, okay, well, my next gig is June 22nd mm-hmm. in London, uh, toulouse Lautrec. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, Down that's June Kennington. 22nd, yes. Um, but my website, which is just my name, so fionaross.co.uk, that's got everything. So all my social media links, my albums, my, you, I mean, everything. And so, yes, you also, users. you do a bit of journalistic work as well. I do do a bit of journalistic yes, work. Yes, with the Jazz UK website. Yes, and Jazz in Europe. Brilliant. So people can go and read your articles and interviews. And yes, and everything's on my site. So there's a kind of section on my site that talks about my journalism. So all the links are on there. You are on social media. I'm everywhere. I have no oh. choice. Not by choice, but well, I have to. Oh, yeah. where can people find out about you very quickly? Uh, on my website, which is erlokin.net. Not, not com, but net. Okay. okay. Erlokin. Although I think now erlokin.com goes there anyway, but erlokin.net. And then it's got gig lists on the top. There's little tabs. You click on that. And, and, uh, and I know see. this is coming Thursday, the 31st of May. You're guesting at the famous, wonderful 606 Club. Yeah, I'm just guesting with Celeste. Yes. Who is a wonderful, young, she's ridiculous for her age. Uh, she's an uh, Italian who specialises in Brazilian music. And honestly, you forget that she isn't Brazilian. That's how, but she's wonderful. Mm. She shouldn't be that good at that age. She really shouldn't be. I saw her at the pheasantry. She was amazing. Yeah, she mm. couldn't she? Mm. But um, the 606, can I, have I got time to tell the 606 story? Go, have we got time very quickly? Go on. When the old 606 existed at the 606... Kings Road. Kings Road. It was originally run by a ne'er-do-well, who I think was called <laughs> Wally. A ne'er-do-well. No, I love it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, he wasn't dangerous or anything, but he was, you know, definitely dodgy. And the place was illegal. They had no, had no <coughs> license and all that stuff. And this, you get, you see, it was a little tiny sort of cellar, not even a basement, a cellar. With, you know those sort of brick brick walls that meet in a point, you know, those sort of things, you know, like almost like the underneath of a church, like a little mini crypt. And it was that tiny with an upright piano against the wall. Anyway, he discovered, I don't know how, but looking through a sort of hole in the brickwork, that next door's basement was just, the basement was completely empty, and <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and so he, he knocked down the bricks. Nothing that obviously held the, the wall up, but the non, you know, the non-important bricks were knocked through, and he doubled the size of his club, and he ran like that for about a year. Okay, <laughs> now comes the apotheosis. One winter's night, it was freezing cold, and the guy who lived next door wanted to put on his kerosene heater, and he thought, I think I've got some in the basement, so he put his. He put his uh, dressing gown on and came all the way downstairs and opened the door to his basement and found a jazz club there. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's amazing. Amazing. I just, I just, the idea of that happening, I just, I, I love the, it. The see that moment as he opened the door. Yeah. <laughs> There's a jazz club. It's brilliant. If, it, if you only knew what a jazz club it was. That was in Indeed. there as well, because it's still going to this uh, But it wasn't like the way it is now. There were no, because it was illegal, no drums, first of all, because it could be, there was a sort of drain pipe thing coming up, which was really for air, you know. Okay. And, uh, and you could hear what was going on. If you stood right next to it, you could hear what was going on downstairs. So no drums because you know didn't want to get ready. And we're talking in a drum studio. So I mean, I know. Oh but my no god! No drums were allowed, and p- there were no bands booked either. It was just somebody would turn up who played piano, and somebody else would turn up with a guitar, and they might not even ever have worked together. They might play different sorts of music, mm. and then somebody would come along with a saxophone, and they'd have to find something that they could play together. I love that. Isn't that what it should be about? I think and we've it, lost some of that It now. used to be a place where you went to after your gigs. Mm. And I used to love that, and now it's it's sort of... Yeah, because that, for me, jazz, that's what jazz is. That's yeah. kind of your know, group of people who just love music, playing, you just enjoying it, it yeah. Like Generally one, in a dodgy underground yeah, environment. Yeah, it was but... like, it's like one of those old Hollywood films, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 
Perry, I love um, that romantic idea. Perry, let's again. pick up the instruments and we'll just happen to play, just play a perfect arrangement. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, unfortunately, we really have come to the end of this week's particular podcast, and I would like to thank my very special guests, but the I'm one not going to. and the only <laughs> Viona Ross. And the one and the only equally Earl Oaken. And don't forget that you can find them vionaross.co.uk and earloaken.net. That's right. Yes, I'm getting the approval from Earl. So until the next time, please remember, happy chatting. And we'll be back again very soon for the next one. Until then, bye for now from yours truly, Tony Stone, here at the Rubik's Drum Studios.